singers that was beautiful. She came to see me again recently. I don't like to see her. I've told her so, but she doesn't care. She can't take a hint, I guess. She always wants to ask the same question. I'm, all, if I'm always caught up in God's glory and power and majesty, but not her. In each church I've been in, her visits, her incessant to ask the same question. And then I came here to be with you wonderful people. And wow, what a, what a wonderful, have I told you recently what a wonderful place this is? <laughs> and how much I enjoy being here. I just love being, I have so much fun preaching about laughter and singing in the choir and writing and a float. Well, that was a verse for me. <laughs> and I guess that one of our favorite hymns will always be, I sing the mighty power of God. It's just wonderful to get caught up in the glory and the power and the majesty of God. And then this past Tuesday, after Michelle had left, I was at my desk, and I said, come in. I thought it was one of you dear people. But it was she. And she pulled up a chair and said, well, Gwen, I see you're off to a fine start here at PCA, having a grand old time and talking about laughter and God's love and glory and power and majesty. Yes, I said, looking at her warily. <laughs> she said, you know what I'm getting ready to say, yes. Each week in your prayer time at PCA, you pray for people who are sick, families of people who have died, you pray for the world and its sorrow. You pray for the planet and her distress. Yes, we do. Well, when there's this suffering all around, what about that? The glory and the power and the majesty of God? What about suffering and God? There is a theological word for this question. It's Theodicy, from the Greek theos, God, and the Greek dike, justify. In other words, trying to explain God, trying to justify God in God's ways. There are two main streams of theodicy. There's the why question. If God is all-powerful and all-loving, then why do horrible things happen? And we will talk about that together. As, as, as a community. I promise you that. That will be the topic for another day. That is not today's question. For the other question is where, not why. Where is God when we suffer? This sermon accepts the fact that we all suffer and then asks, what about that? How are we to understand our suffering? Must it be something that defeats us? Is suffering only meaninglessness and hopelessness? Or might suffering lead somehow through grace to some deeper experience of holiness? So, where is God in our suffering? Well, first a few answers from the past which we roundly reject. There is the answer, number one, that if we suffer, it is because we deserve to suffer. There are many, many examples of this, but perhaps most recent and almost too painful to even believe. Someone claiming to be a Christian pastor preaching that the Orlando massacre was God's answer to being gay or lesbian. One wonders if this person is at all acquainted with Scripture. Job, a righteous and holy person, befallen of tragedy after tragedy, stands on this side of the pulpit. And Jesus, 
who is pure love and light and cries, My God, why have you forsaken me? Stands on this side of the pulpit, and they both say, We do not deserve this. So where is God so? The second answer that we reject is escape. Now, many of you, my generation are older, and maybe some that have listened to those stations that have oldie goldies, I don't know, will remember <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel's tune, I Am a Rock. I have my books and my poetry to protect me. I'll build walls, a fortress deep and mighty. I have no need of friendship. Friendship causes pain. It's laughter and it's loving. I disdain. I am a rock and an island. And a rock feels no pain. And an island never cries. To escape the question by saying, there is no God, so just back down the hatch. We reject that. The third answer is, historical answer, is to deny that suffering exists at all. The legendary preacher Fred Craddock tells the story. His mother had died. He had flown back for the funeral. He writes, into my sister's house where we kept the body of my mother till time for the funeral came friends to say what can be said, what cannot be said. And into the room burst a woman I did not know in her forties. She had a huge Bible, a 40 or 50 pound, but it was a large Bible. She had a smile beyond Mona Lisa, and she was bouncing on her tiptoes and saying, Hallelujah, hallelujah, isn't it thrilling to know, isn't it a joy? Oh, aren't you just so excited? And she said this in tones that filled the rooms, and those who tried to meet her were unsuccessful. She passed by once and said, and you, you, you're one of the sons. Yes. Oh, isn't it marvelous, isn't it wonderful they all, oh, she said. And when she circled the field a second time, I said, lady, would you stop a moment? She said, what is it? I said, my mother is dead. She is not here. She is risen, but she is not here. Do you want me to feel guilty because I miss her? That woman wanted only to speak of the glory and the power and the majesty these are three ways that people have tried to understand what about suffering in God, but they won't do. There is another way, is the way of Jesus. Here is what was happening in our scripture from Luke. Jesus is in the thick of his ministry, the Christ, healing the sick, raising the dead, sending the disciples out with power and authority. He just fed the 5,000 with loaves and fishes, and he was tired. And he went off to pray. And as he went, he could hear, overhear the talk. There was a buzz going on about him. Glory and power and majesty. They were sounding like TV evangelists. <laughs> Jesus shook his head and then gathered his disciples up and asked, Who do they think I am? And the disciples answered, What, John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets? And Jesus said, And you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And that was correct. Peter got it correct, and they were all excited. You know, yes, it's going to be about the glory and the power and the majesty. And Jesus goes and pulls up a chair and says, I've got something to tell you. You want to know? Who the Christ is? The Christ is the one who suffers. And we gasp. We get God suffering? Our suffering is one thing, but God? I have learned over the years in the churches that I've served and other churches that Isaiah 53 is not a popular scripture. You don't hear it very often. Not surprising. Listen, this is describing the prediction of the Christ. Who has believed what we have heard? He grew up out of dry ground. He had no form of comeliness that we would want to look at him. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. 
It is hard to take in what Isaiah is saying. The Christ, no one even wanted to look at him. He was so common because he was suffering. He was one of us. Beloved, have you ever suffered and then felt isolated? Feel like people are avoiding you? Turning away, don't know what to say to you, so they abandon, abandon you, avoiding eye contact. This is extraordinary. Jesus was the Christ, not because he was above suffering, but because he entered into suffering. Emmanuel is what that means. This is what makes our understanding of God so unique and for me exciting. Other gods may sit high and lift it up, eating grapes and being fanned. But this God gets right down with us in the rough and tumble of life with calluses on his feet and his hairline beginning to recede. He stands outside the grave of his good friend Lazarus, crying like a baby. That Christ suffered because he was one of us. And we suffer. Do we not suffer? And he suffered. We suffer. And what Jesus is teaching us in the scripture and his life is that suffering is a part of life. It is not an intrusion that doesn't belong. It is not an aberration. How did this get involved in the past? Rather, this suffering we experience is Redemptive. Please do not hear me saying redemptive as in going to heaven. That would be escapism. No, as any good liberation theologian knows, redemption here means saving us for life at its fullest on earth. Jesus grew and flourished as the Christ not because he remained above the prey but because he mixed it up with life and all of life's contingencies. He suffered the wounds of life, which led him ever more deeply into the realm of humanity, which, oh my goodness, it turns out, is also the realm of divinity. He taught us that it is in our humanity that divinity resides. And friends, you cannot be truly human and not suffer. Jesus understands that a rock feels no pain, but he knows it doesn't feel joy either. Jesus knows an island never cries, but he knows it doesn't laugh as well. And to touch the divinity that is accessible to us through our humanity, we get to know joy and pain, tears and laughter. The glory and the power and the majesty of God, you see, is the whole enchilada. <clears throat> and so when we answer the question, where is God when we suffer, we are bold to say, she is by our side, walking with us into a room called fully. The sermon today is not meant to explain the cause of suffering. And please hear me. Please don't anyone leave here hearing that I said that God bestows suffering for our own good. I do not believe that. But the sermon is claiming that God uses the suffering that comes to us in this human life to make us more like Jesus. Which is to say, more human. I close with this. Those of you, again, who are of my generation or older will remember the TV show All of the Family. Yes? <laughs> the main character was? Archie Bunker. For those of you who are younger and are looking around saying, what in the world are you talking about? Let me try. It's only going to be an attempt to introduce you and give you a picture of Archie Bunker. <laughs> Here was the perfect picture of someone intent on avoiding suffering. With a beer in one hand, watching the New York Giants football team, get out of the way, meathead, he yells at Michael, he's 
standing in front of the TV, his son-in-law, ding back. When is supper going to be ready? <laughs> Referring to his wife, either. <laughs> Food, beer, cigar, football, oh, me, man. <laughs> Archie didn't like talking about Sappy thing. Get away with me with all that stuff. <clears throat> but never will I forget this one episode. <laughs> Gloria, Archie and Edith's daughter, and Mike, the meathead, had become pregnant. But there had been trouble, cramps, and bleeding. They had rushed Gloria to the hospital only to find it was too late. There had been a miscarriage. She was grief stricken, inconsolable, crying and crying and crying up in her room, Archie's little girl, heartbreaking. There came at the door. Yes, she said. Who is it? The door cracked just a little bit. One eye was all you could see of Archie. Daddy, is that you? Come in. Archie opened the door, came in, and then closed the door quietly and leaned back up against the door, afraid to go in further. Yes, Daddy. What is it? His eyes were big as saucers. They were glistening. He said nothing. Daddy, do you want something? What, what is it? He couldn't speak. You, you want to tell me something, Daddy. Is that right? One ear, one tear escaped from the well of his eye and began down his face. You want to tell me something and you don't know how. Is that it, Daddy? He nodded. You're real sorry for what happened to me, aren't you, Daddy? And you love me very much. And Archie Bunker said, Oh, jeez, my little girl. And he rushed to her side, and he took her into his arms, and he held her, and they suffered together. Archie Bunker 